Minister, the, no, the dual diagnosis no wrong door bill is an important piece of legislation that aims to plug the gaps in services that exist between mental health and addiction. And this was one of the first pieces of legislation that I introduced after being elected. And the reason for this was, having worked in frontline addiction services, I seen how vulnerable people could fall through the gaps between addiction and mental health services. And for the purpose of this bill, the dual diagnosis refers to people who present for treatment that have a substance misuse and mental health conditions. People who have dual diagnosis often fall between these gaps. Addiction and mental health often go hand in hand. Addiction may lead to an onset of a mental health issue, or a mental health issue can lead to people using substances as a coping mechanism. And because of the inadequacies in the state's mental health systems and addiction services, people can turn to drink and drugs to give calm to an anxious inner world, to basically self-medicate. Um, and this is where the problems can occur. The mental health problems remain, but they are added to by an addiction problem. This bill will mean that no matter what door a person knocks on for help for addiction and mental health problems, that they are treated with dignity. And one simple way to begin this process is to resource, resource addiction and mental health services to produce a joint care plan. A joint care plan between addiction and mental health services needs to be developed and to make sure that people get the care they need when they need it and where they need it. There can be no wrong door when it comes to dual diagnosis. And as I said, having worked in frontline services, I know that the compassion and the empathy and the understanding is the core of many of our addiction services. But unfortunately, they are not resourced, to, resourced or supported to deal with dual diagnosis. Now, in fairness, I've worked in these services and people do their absolute best when someone arrives at the door, which they wouldn't have the necessary resources to, 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 to treat that person. And because the way the HSE works, if you're not given the funding, to do dual diagnosis and you're doing something outside your funding, there can be penalties on that as well. Um, but this legislation will progress the provision of dual diagnosis uh, service across the state, which would have a knock-on effect for indiv individualised case management plans. We need to recognise that addiction is not a standalone issue. Wraparound supports and services are the only way to properly help people succeed in their recovery. Like in, Sh in Sinn Féin's alternative budget, we made provisions for funding for a mental health nurse to work in each of the 24 local drug and alcohol task forces. And this is just one solution in strengthening teams and making sure that addiction services have the appropriate experience in treating someone with dual diagnosis. Keltoy, a trauma-informed state-run residential facility treating addiction and mental health uh, comorbidities, was temporarily closed in March in 2020 during COVID, but it's still not open three years later, Minister, and this must be a priority, and I'll touch on that again in my closing statement, because, as I said, there's a number of people who have contacted me over the last while, and a number of stakeholders who are really desperate to get a dual diagnosis, proper dual diagnosis service in place, and last year I was at the launch of a report by the mental health reform called Dual Recovery. This is a qualitative exploration of the views of stakeholders working in mental health, substance use and homelessness in Ireland on the barriers to recovery for individuals with dual diagnosis. And one of their findings was mental health teams need to be trained in addiction and addiction teams need to be trained in mental health. And that's the core of this. There has to be an understanding there. You don't, ha not, you don't have to know how to fix it, but you have to know where to get the help. It's basically sign, simple signposting arrangements. And that you, you have, they also recommend that you have an understanding about how that affects the person and what they do. The recommendations of the, of the report that the Mental Health Reform published, I fully support, including the implement of a fit for purpose model of care urgent, urgently, uh, develop and run an awareness raising campaign on dual diagnosis and dual recovery, and provide ring fence funding to support dual diagnosis treatment in existing services and improve access to housing and social inclusion. The recent announcement of the Citizens' Assembly on drug use is welcome, <coughs> and, and this is a conversation that needs to happen. We must make sure that people who have dual diagnosis are central in, to this conversation and that their voices are heard. We must ensure that people with dual diagnosis do not fall through any more cracks. The Minister, I'm aware that you, you've tabled an amendment to this bill that say it will be read again in 12 months' time. And while I much would prefer if this was dealt with now instead of kicking it down the road, I will accept the amendment as it does make sense in relation to 
the upcoming programme of work, the Citizens Assembly on drug use, the mental health bill being drafted, I'm on the, the committee that, that is going to be dealing with that, and the amendments to the Health Act in 2004, which are currently being progressed. So, as I said, well, I'm going to accept your amendment, I'm going to accept it in good faith, and I'm going to work with you, Minister. And I've said this on day one since I took this role in making sure that dual diagnosis is at the, is at the heart of this year's programme of work. So, in an idea award, Minister, the hope is if, if, the department, if your department does the work, there will be no need to read this bill next year, this time next year. If all the work is in the model of care, which I'll touch on when we close the statement, and all the, the, all the, uh, the Citizens' Assembly, the Mental Health Bill, and the, and the Health Act of 2004, if they are all inclusive of dual diagnosis, there will be no need for us to read this bill a second time next year. But I will be holding you to account to that, Minister. Thank you. Minister, I want to begin by first thanking my colleague, Deputy Mark Ward, for the hard work he's done in this legislation. I know the work he's done, and I suppose I just want to say that only, only for him and other groups who support, who will work on the ground, we wouldn't be here today discussing this bill. Mental health, ref health reform have been particularly supportive, but conversation with groups like Citywide, Silsha, and other groups have helped us to get here today. The knowledge and experience that they have shared with me and Deputy Ward has been invaluable, and I want to take this opportunity to thank them for meeting with us, sharing their experiences, and helping us to build Sinn Féin's policy that reflects what is actually happening and what people are facing on the ground. Due diagnosis, when a person presents with both mental health illness and active addiction, is a complex area but in, in a, an area that we need to move forward with. A study by Mental Health Reform found that individuals with dual diagnosis face significant barriers to accessing, accessing appropriate care. Those barriers include poor collaboration between services, a lack of training for health and social care professionals, and limited access to planned and continued care. Participants also highlighted a number of social barriers, including homelessness, housing insecurity, social exclusion, and stigma. The bill is called the Dual Diagnosis No Wrong Door Bill. It is vital that we emphasise the importance of there being no wrong door. At the minute, so many doors are closed to those presenting. We are, we are, they are often forced to wait until they are a crisis, at which point they present to already overburdened and understaffed emergency services who are not equipped to help them. The closure of Keltoy was a huge blow to those helping people in addiction and working with men, those with mental health issues. The one facility that we had that was properly equipped and trained to intervene in the most serious dual diagnosis cases was closed by this government in March 2020, almost three years ago. It still remains closed. This was a facility with evidence-based, trauma-focused health interventions that offer, offered wraparound care and treatment to those who desperately needed it. An independent review of Keltoy previously found that despite dealing with the most complex of cases, the facility had a 10% higher success rate one year after treatment than many others. This bill won't reopen Keltoy, but it will force the HSE to lay out plans to provide services like Keltoy right across the state. It will be a step towards addressing the postcode lottery of dual diagnosis services that currently exist. Dual diagnosis can come in many forms. People can have severe mental health issue, issues and minor addiction issues, or vice versa. Addiction can be used as a means to cope with mental health issues, or mental health issues can develop from addiction. We welcome that a clinical lead has been appointed for dual diagnosis. We believe this bill will give that person and the HSC a stronger statutory footing for developing development of services. This bill speaks to a commitment given by the government and aids them in moving that commitment forward. We are not interested in political point scoring here. We are interested in giving people the dignity and respect they deserve. 
We want to make sure that services are not forced to turn people away and that when people need help, whether it's for mental health issues or for addiction issues, these people need support. Now, we welcome the announcement this week of the Citizens' Assembly on Drugs uh, in April, and we will engage with that, and we will hope that it will be a positive as the other Citizens' Assemblies have been. But saying that, I know that the government intended to delay this bill for 12 months. People need services now. People need pr services provided. They can't be waiting long times. I know Deputy Ward has said he'll work with you and we will work together to be constructive and positive. But I hope I'm not being cynical here. I agree with Deputy Ward. I hope that this time, 12 months, that we don't need to read this a second time because the government have moved forward. We will work with the government and with the ministers and with the department to try to achieve that. And I hope we can, but only time will tell. Now, the minister, I think you have to move the amending motion. I move. So, I think you're... Garv Mahagut, I would like to begin by thanking Deputy Ward and Deputy Gould for initiating this bill before us at second stage tonight in the Dáil and also for the opportunity to discuss the very important topic of dual diagnosis for people with a mental health difficulty. And I'm delighted to be joined by Minister Hildegard Nocton, um, who has responsibility for the National Drug Strategy. Uh, the Health Amendment Dual Diagnosis No Wrong Door Bill seeks to amend the Health Act 2004 by inserting a definition of dual diagnosis in the interpret interpretation section of that Act and by amending the general obligation on the HSC in Section 31.3 to prepare a service plan outlining the type and volume of health and personal social services to be provided, including a specific requirement to include du dual diagnosis in the HSC National Service Plan. The private member's bill before us this evening has not been opposed, as this government recognises the challenges that those with a dual diagnosis face in accessing services appropriate to their needs. However, I and my colleague are seeking approval, as I've said, for a 12-month timed amendment to the bill for a number of reasons, which I will now discuss and which you refer to already, Deputy. Firstly, deputies may be aware that the government this week agreed to establish a citizens' assembly on drug use, and I know that has been welcomed um, across, across the Oireachtas. The citizens' assembly will be asked to consider the legislative policy and operational changes the state should make to significantly reduce the harmful impacts of illicit drugs on individuals, families, communities, and wider society. It would be prudent to allow the citizens' assembly to carry out its important work before the second reading of this bill. This Citizens' Assembly will be an invaluable opportunity to discuss drug use in Ireland in a holistic manner, and by letting it take place prior to the second reading, it will provide for a more informed, comprehensive debate on the issue. Secondly, the Department of Health is currently progressing a mental health bill to significantly overhaul our existing mental health legislation. A timed amendment of one year would allow the Mental Health Bill to be drafted and introduced to the Oireachtas and allow further debate on this bill to take place in the context of a new, more progressive mental health legislation. And Deputy Ward, as I said to you earlier today, um, this bill has received priority drafting. There's three drafters working on it in the Attorney General's office and uh, joined um, by James from, uh, from the, um, the department doing phenomenal work. And it's a massive, massive piece of work. It's one of the biggest bills that I have ever seen and there's a huge amount of work going into it. Um, and, you know, I, I do think it's really important that we would be able to enact that. So I do uh, thank you for your cooperation. Furthermore, the private member's bill as written will have impacts on the operation of other provisions in the Health Act 2004. Department of Health officials are currently preparing a health amendment bill to amend that 2004 Act. The purpose of this bill would be to make amendments to the Health Act to include provisions primarily related to HSE service planning and financial management. It formalises certain developments, requirements and timelines for specific documents related to the, um, such as the replacement of the National Service Plan with a performance delivery plan. The bill will also contain provisions related to the transfer of functions of disabilities and other miscellaneous items. A timed amendment of one year will allow discussion on this private member's bill in the knowledge of what the planned amendments to the 2004 Act will be. Dual diagnosis is the term used when two medical conditions are pre present at the same time. 
Within mental health, dual diagnosis might mean a person experiences both a mental health difficulty and an addiction, or a disability such as autism. Given the definition of dual diagnosis provided for in this bill, I will limit my intervention to dual diagnosis of mental health and addiction difficulties. The government acknowledges that access to mental health services for those with a dual diagnosis has been an issue and can cause huge distress for some. This has been recognised and the government is actively seeking to improve our dual diagnosis services at both a policy and implementation level. The government is committed to improve in all aspects of our mental health service, including dual diagnosis, in line with sharing the vision. And it was the first mental health um, policy that accepted and acknowledged uh, dual diagnosis. Our national mental health policy and connecting for life, our national strategy to reduce suicide. Budget 2022 saw an unprecedented level of funding, total 1.149 billion allocated to our overall mental health. And this continued with a record 1.2 billion to mental health services in 23. This will allow us to progress a variety of mental health initiatives aimed at supporting people in crisis and to continue to improve mental health services to the benefit of all, including those with a dual diagnosis. New development funding in 2022 was also provided to allow further implementation of sharing the vision. Investment of 750,000 euros, which is a full year cost of 1 million, in 2022 was provided to enable the continued expansion of the specialist teams under the dual diagnosis clinical programme. The HSE is a key stakeholder in the implementation of the recommendations of sharing the vision and sits on the National Implementation Monitoring Committee for the implementation of the 100 policy recommendations. The work of NIMI continues to progress following its establishment late last year. It is tasked with driving and overseeing implementation of the policies recommendations, including those relating to dual diagnosis. Good progress has been made on the detailed implementation. Sharing the vision recognises that people with a dual diagnosis should have access to appropriate mental health services and supports by addressing existing service gaps and developing stepped integrated models of care. Recommendation 57 states that a tiered model of integrated service provision for individuals with a dual diagnosis should be developed to ensure the pathway to care are clear. The HSC Dual Diagnosis Improvement Programme also emphasises the need for integrated services across primary care and specialist mental health services. Dual diagnosis is a particularly important area, as we know that service users living with both substance misuse and mental health difficulties are often among the most vulnerable in society. The needs of people presenting with substance misuse and mental health difficulties are complex and may be coupled with other issues such as poor physical health or homelessness. The HSC has recognised the need to improve services for people with comorbid difficulties and that an integrated approach between mental health and addiction services is necessary. The HSC clinical programme for dual diagnosis was developed to respond to this need. The aim of this important programme is to develop a standardised evidence-based approach to the identification, assessment and treatment of comorbid mental health difficulties and substance misuse. This includes increasing awareness of the frequent coexistence of mental health difficulties and substance misuse, ensuring there is a clear clinical pathway for management of people with such a dual diagnosis, including when they present to emergency departments, ensuring a standardised service is provided throughout the country and ensuring adolescents are also included within the scope of this clinical programme. Work has already taken place to progress this aim, including the appointment of a national clinical lead, a programme manager and the establishment of a national steering group. A key and integral part of the dual diagnosis programme is the development of the model of care. The HSC model of care for dual diagnosis for adults and adolescents 10 to 17 years of age has been drafted. The draft deputy is currently with the College of Psychiatrists for approval and the college is actively considering this model this month. I hope to see the model approved by the College later this month and its publication by the HSE shortly thereafter. The overarching aim of the model of care will be to ensure a clear clinical pathway for all adolescents and adults suspected of having a dual diagnosis and access to a timely mental health service nationally. The model of care has been developed in collaboration with recovery agencies and advocacy groups that represent the experience of service users. It is vital that the voice and lived experience of people needing services is at the centre of developments. The model of care will be delivered on a CHO basis and provided in an integrated manner across the primary care division and the mental health service with, uh, in collaboration with the acute hospital groups. 
One of the key components of the model of care is the establishment of specialist teams to support individuals with a dual diagnosis. The model of care recommends 12 adult specialist dual diagnosis teams nationally and four adolescent hub teams, each with 13 whole time equivalents, including clinical and admin staff members. CHO3, which covers Limerick, Clare and North Tip, was identified as the first adult dual diagnosis site with many of the team members already recruited. CHO4, which covers the areas of Kerry, North Cork, North Lee, South Lee and West Cork, has been identified as the second adult dual diagnosis site and the recruitment process has commenced there too, with the consultant post currently being advertised. CHO9, which covers the areas of Dublin North, Dublin North Central and Dublin North West, has been identified as the first adolescent dual diagnosis site, with posts being advertised shortly for this team. Discussions are also underway to establish the HSE National Dual Diagnosis Rehabilitation Centre as recommended in the model of care. A two-tier training programme also recommended as part of the model of care is currently being examined by the HSE with a view to identifying gaps in existing training and plans to ensure that training is available to meet needs in the initial sites as rollout begins. Additional adolescent and adult teams for 23 and 24 will roll out according to the resources available for the dual diagnosis programme in the HSE National Service Plan and the government will continue to fund these posts within the annual estimates process. It takes approximately between 12 and 18 months to put a full, dual, uh, full um, multidisciplinary team in place and it is really important that the, the, the funding on a yearly basis continues. Work also continues between the HSE National Clinical Programme for Dual Diagnosis and community partners to ensure local responses to dual diagnosis will complement the rollout of the model of care. Work on the use of digital interventions to support individuals with a dual diagnosis is being progressed collaboratively in the HSE between the National Clinical Programme and Community Alcohol, Social Inclusion, Digital and Mental Health, Digital Divisions. In addition, the HSE and Mental Health Ireland have developed a resource for people affected by dual diagnosis at drugs.ie. The website provides advice for people to look after their mental health during crisis, including how to access mental health and addiction services. Government policies, including sharing the vision and reducing harm, supporting recovery, set out clear commitments to improving services for people with a dual diagnosis. The cross-government high-level justice task force to consider the mental health and addiction challenges of those who come into contact with the criminal justice sector examined dual diagnosis among individuals who came into contact with the system. The task force was established in 2021 to meet the government's commitment to ensure that critical mental health needs of people in prison are met, addiction treatments are provided and appropriate primary care supports are available on release. Overall, the task force put forward 61 recommendations, which emphasise the shared responsibility of a number of government departments and agencies to deliver on meeting the needs of those with mental health and addiction challenges in contact with the criminal justice system. It is recognised internationally that vulnerable people with mental health and addiction challenges are overrepresented in our criminal justice systems. We have a responsibility to ensure that as many as possible within this population are diverted away from the criminal justice system and provided with the appropriate health and social care supports. All of us know there is no quick, quick fix solution to the challenges highlighted by the task force. No one service can address the change, needs, the change needed on its own. The task force final report published last September provided a clear path forward on how we can achieve this and work together to improve supports in the key area of forensic mental health care involving all relevant frontline agencies. The task force recommendations relating to the health sector will be progressed in line with Sloan Care, sharing the vision and other relevant health policies, including the prioritisation of dual diagnosis services for vulnerable people with mental health and addiction challenges, and they will help reduce the root cause of offending behaviours. I wish to thank Deputy Ward again, and I wish to thank you for accepting um, the amendment. And I also welcome, as I say any time I speak here about mental health, the opportunity to speak um, about the government's commitment to improving mental health services. I look forward to discussing the bill again in 12 months' time, hopefully we won't have to, and at which time I hope the Citizens' Assembly will have taken place and our dual diagnosis services will be further developed. Gaurav Mahathir. Thank you, Minister. We now have 30 minutes and four speakers from Sinn Féin. Uh, Deputy Amarku, Deputy Brown, Deputy Buckley and Deputy Patricia Ryan. I'm not sure how you are. 
divvying it up. This is where I usually promise not to take the full time and then don't necessarily keep to my word, but I, I will attempt it. Look, um, well, first of all, I'd like to tap, thank Deputy Ward and Deputy Gould. It's a decent piece of legislation. It's obviously absolutely necessary. You can even hear that from what the Minister has said. And I suppose that's us accepting that dual diagnosis is a particular issue. It's almost it's the crossover between two huge issues that uh, what we're all dealing with. Um, you know, as politicians, we, we become well aware of some of these cases, and, and unfortunately, some of the cases you end up dealing with um, are particularly difficult. Um, and I suppose that's we, we need to create a scenario and a situation where there is no wrong door, right? What is being proposed in this piece of legislation, and that's accepting that. Uh, the Minister has also laid out a legislative framework and a pathway where we can get to a better place as regards there being no wrong door or dual diagnosis, call it uh, what, what you will, but it's, it's ensuring that we actually get to this point. We're talking about frontline services and ensuring that everybody is properly trained in relation to dual diagnosis, and that's those that work in addiction services and that's that, those that work uh, in mental uh, health services. Um, uh, but we know that the issue is far wider than that. We know that we actually, when we move beyond this point, this is an absolutely necessary piece of legislation. I, I, as I say, hopefully it's a piece of legislation that won't be needed in a year's time, um, that what the, the Minister is promising will be uh, seen to be delivered for those people that are out there. Um, but beyond that, we will have to deal with the particular issue um, of um, hospitals and ensuring that an A&E isn't the wrong door. And we've often seen particular services. And the other thing is, it's all well and good. We can set the correct legal framework. We can put all the correct legislation in, in place. But if we do not resource and we don't train um, and we don't have those people with those necessary skill sets in position, we will be dealing with the issue that we are dealing with um, at the minute. Look, I, I, I recall uh, just in relation to the, the, partic the particular issue, um, and it was very well put by the two previous, by, by all the previous speakers. Um, of it, it's almost a chicken and egg issue in relation to um, in relation to dual diagnosis. I, I remember uh, Derek Pepper of Shine um, spoke at an event lately to remember uh, Harry Taff, who um, who we, we lost, and it was a Dundalk FC event. And Harry had uh, done a huge amount of work for them over many many years, and and. Um, we, we, we recall with, with sadness the, the loss of Harry, but I, I remember something Derek had spoken um, about previously, and this was the fact that we all have within us, within the brain, I think he, he, he used the term a hand grenade, um, and that anything can be the trigger that releases this in relation to mental uh, health issues. And obviously, and, and we all know the, the issues that there are with drug addiction, drug abuse, and the issues that there have always been with alcohol abuse and alcohol addiction, particularly in, in this country, um, that they can obviously be the means by which this grenade is released. And then it's a case, if you, first of all, that person isn't going to, be, to get better unless unless that there is a medical plan, unless they get the treatment that they need. And, and unfortunately for many of them, this can be a recurring problem over many, many years. So it does not help when we have services that uh, are not trained, are not resourced sufficiently, and basically turn people away. Look, we're all aware, we've all dealt with uh, families, we've all dealt with individuals that have been going through absolute psychosis. And we all know that the guards deal with this on a day-by-day -day basis. And we know at times that you would have people who are brought up to the a and Drogheda, and sometimes, depending on whether a doctor signs a form or doesn't sign a form, they may be brought to uh, cross lanes. That's the DOPD in, in, in Drogheda. And then we're dealing with services that can't, then we deal with the dual diagnosis question. And really there are no winners in relation to that. And we have a huge amount of people with, as I say, a considerable amount of issues that are never actually dealt with. Now we can individualize these issues and we can deal with addiction and we can deal with mental health services and we are aware of, if we talk even from a hospital, from a HSE point of view, we know all the positions that aren't filled. We all know of the positions 
even that should be there, whether we're talking about nurses, whether we're talking about doctors, whether we're talking about OTs, whether we're talking about psychologists. We all know the workforce planning and everything that needs to be done. I would hate to be the person that's dealing with um, addiction services at this point in time. And we're all aware of people who've worked in the particular field of addiction services and the incredible pressure that they've come under. And at times, people that have been broken by just the amount of issues that they are dealing with. But the particular issue that arises, um, as I say, when this when this grenade is released, that particular issue can mean that somebody has no right door to go to at this point in time. So obviously we need to make sure that the frontline services are dealt with. We make, need to make sure that those frontline services there then are sufficiently uh, sufficiently resourced and we make sure that we have all those positions and all those, uh, all those skill sets that are required from a point of view of, of delivering. Um, but beyond that, we really need to look at how we deal with the issue in relation to hospital, in relation to A&E, in relation to emergency services. Because first of all, we all know we've all had, we're going to have multiple conversations here probably till the end of time about multidisciplinary, um, um, whether, uh, here, the other thing we all love talking about is all a government approach. Um, but really, when we're dealing with these with these particular issues, we do need to make sure we have multidisciplinary teams. We need to make sure that we can bring to bear what is necessary. The other thing is, like I said, when you're dealing with emergency services, the main difficulty is that you have an that the early interventions, those easier interventions, at times we do not have them. Uh, look, Minister, you know we've dealt with the issue of. Um, people with eating disorders and we know that we don't have the positions for dietitians and, and other services that are required whereby we could possibly intervene at an earlier stage and deal with those particular issues. So, so I, I, I think we really need to get all our ducks in a line. As I said, this piece of legislation and the trajectory you're talking about are obviously positives. We need to make sure that we can deliver upon them. We do need to do a wider piece of work. Um, you're talking about evidence-based, um, and look, if we're looking at CSO figures, if I, if I look at my own part of the world, like we know we're utterly underrepresented represented in relation to mental health teams, in relation to all the services that are required. And we know that we've had fill-in, whether it's addiction services or mental health services, by here, people out of need and out of necessity, whose family suffered from these particular positions and when I think of anything I'm talking of you know whether I'm talking about the family addiction support network or I'm talking about tourists or I'm talking about um, as I say particularly in Dundalk uh, but if I'm talking about the red door in 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 Drogheda uh, I, 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 you know and, and that's literally just dealing with as I say the, the issues around addiction and, and family supports and all the rest of it and I think we're all very glad that the citizens assembly um, has been set for uh, April I think we need to ensure that we engage all the stakeholders along with the citizens and that we see best practice whether we're talking domestically or on an international basis that needs to happen because we, we all know the particular issues that our communities are dealing with whether that's, that's from addiction right down to drug debt intimidation and the sheer pressure that individuals are, are put under but look um, the, the last thing I'll put to the Minister is, is very specific, it's a constituency issue, um, it's, it's Our Lady of Lourdes in Drogheda and it's the fact that there is a mental health liaison team that are in operation um, during office hours but we do not have a service beyond that. I think there have been discussions in relation to it and I think it's a major failing because we all know that when we're dealing with issues of psychosis and other such issues and when the guards and everyone else is dealing with them, they are generally in the evening and, and nighttime hours and I think that's something that has to be addressed. I think there are sufficient uh, that there are sufficient um, resources to probably to put that in place at this point in time. We just need an agreement and that involves obviously all the players, whether it's the DOPD, whether it's the RCSI hospital group and Our Lady of Lourdes. Um, I leave it at that. Gurumaygov Galer. Thank you. Minister, first of all, I want to commend uh, Deputy Mark Ward and Deputy Tommy Gould for this bull, Bob Bill. What this bill provides for is something that has sadly been missing for far too long. Just ask the voluntary organisations that try to fill the gaps left empty by the state. They'll tell you the level of demand they have for the services they provide in the area of combined addiction and mental health and how the state does not provide for it adequately. We've spoken about dual diagnosis during my time in this House on a number of occasions. We've outlined shortages in terms of service provision on the path of the state. 
I have outlined to this House how the former voluntary organisation Karma and Nina in Tipperary was concerned about its future because they were prepared to go the extra mile while the state did other than while clinical lead positions remained vacant and action stalled. As the Minister will know if you will, the nature of mental health issues and drug addiction, addiction is a complex one. But for no one else <coughs> it is more complex than for the person dealing with these issues and those who are trying to get help for them. As in other areas of the health services, including mental health, dietary and so on, people can get moved from pillar to post because their needs don't fall into step with whatever services are available. This causes people who, to find themselves in these kinds of situations who, to fall through the cracks and go without treatment they so badly need. Mental health reform and their research on barriers to dual recovery for individuals with a dual diagnosis spoke of the lack of interagency collaboration when it comes to helping people with dual diagnosis. Deputy Ward and Gould are seeking to address this through the No Wrong Door Bill. We need to see a joint care plan between the addiction and mental health services that develop so that no matter what the door the person knocks on for help or addiction and mental health problems, that they are treated appropriately and with dignity. Like my colleagues, I understand that you are accepting this, are accepting this in the contents of the bill as is, and I welcome and acknowledge that. But what I will ask is that you don't play politics with this by accepting it and then kicking it down the road. And as what was said earlier, we welcome the Citizens Assembly and look forward to its recommendations and working with it and with you, Minister, to implement its findings. Will you assure that you will not put this amendment on the long finger and you will enact it for the benefit of the many people out there who need and what it provides for for Margaret Gerald. Um, I would like to thank my colleagues, Chapter Ward and Gould, for bringing this bill to the House. For far too long, individuals with a dual diagnosis, which means having both a mental health and a substance abuse issue, have been left without adequate support and care. The current system often means that individuals are passed forward and back between different services, leading to confusion and a lack of continuity of care. The proposed legislation aims to address this by ensuring that those with a dual diagnosis have access to a streamlined and integrated service. The no wrong door approach of this bill means that any person seeking help for a mental health or substance abuse issue will be directed towards the appropriate service, regardless of where they first seek help. The approach removes any unnecessary delays in assisting the necessary services minister, ensuring the best possible outcome for those in need. The bill also seeks to increase the number of mental health and addiction specialists, ensuring that individuals with a dual diagnosis receive the best possible care. By expanding the range of services available and providing greater access to professionals with expertise in this area, the bill aims to help individuals with a dual diagnosis to manage their conditions and to live their lives to their full potential. The Health Amendment Dual Diagnosis No Wrong Door Bill 2021 also highlights the need for greater collaboration between mental health and addiction services. By bringing these services together and working in partnership, we can create a more comprehensive system that meets the needs of those with a dual diagnosis. This is a very positive step forward in mental health and addiction care in Ireland. It will undoubtedly have a significant impact on the lives of those with a dual diagnosis, providing them with a greater access to the services they need to manage their conditions effectively. For too long, mental health has been the poor relation of the health services. Sadly, delays in diagnosis and treatment cost lives, Minister. And these are not just statistics. There are parents, siblings, children, spouses and friends. Services must improve and implementing this bill is a good step along that road. And I also uh, am aware that Deputy Ward is accepting the amendment, Minister, and I also would like to think that we will move forward quicker than the 12 months, if possible, please. Thank you, Cahirla. First of all, I just want to acknowledge uh, the work that Deputy Ward and Deputy Gould put into this, but I also want to acknowledge that the two ministers are here tonight. And there is actually a joined up consensus here. And uh, Minister Butler would have been aware of it. Uh, Minister Daly, Minister McEntee would, but I have to say, sometimes there's no colour, class, creed, religion or politics when it comes to mental health. And I think that sometimes, you know, as I said, sometimes we do argue here, and we, we agree to disagree at times, but as legislators, whether we're in government or not, it's about doing the right thing. And I think, with spe specifically with mental health, it is an extremely 
um, tough subject, but it goes across every sector in society. It doesn't matter what means you have in your back pocket or what, what kind of a house you have or whatever. But I do welcome in the opening statement, uh, Minister, that you know, we're on about dual diagnosis, and it's not just about um, addiction and mental health. You mentioned autism and disabilities and stuff, because that was something that was being ne neglected as well. And I do want to take on board the fact that you've also mentioned that high-level um, task force within the justice system. And I, I, I do want to acknowledge as well where it says in your statement that it is recognised internationally that the vulnerable people with mental health and addiction challenges are overrepresented in our criminal justice system. So it, this, it, it is a huge, massive amount of work. And in fairness to both Deputy Ward, Deputy Gould, and yourself, Minister, to actually have a consistency to say, right, we actually need more time. Nobody disagrees with what we're all trying to do, but let's try and work together. And there is, i.e., the Mental Health Act, probably the assisted decision making because coming into it, then you'll have the justice side, you'll have the children's side, you'll have the disability side, and on top of that, you need your resources and your plans in place. The very fact that we're still talking about it is a huge plus. We're not arguing about it anymore. We're actually talking as we're working together, which is a big, big plus here. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that you know, the plans that have been put in place for those pilot projects as well. So it's, it's acknowledged that it's been, it's needed. And I can remember going back here, I think it was around 17, I think Minister Daly was the minister at the time, and how difficult it was for parents with children with dual diagnosis. And there was a case, I'll never forget it, the mother set up in that gallery and asked me to tell her son's story. And it was actually addiction, not alcohol or drugs, but it was cigarettes. And the poor young fellow went into um, a and &E. It wasn't his first time in a and &E. And he was lucky to be kept in, but he wanted a cigarette. And they, they kept refusing, refusing, but eventually he got out and he never returned. He never returned home either, unfortunately. You know, it, it, does, it has to be a common sense approach as well in this. But I, I do recognise, and I have to recognise, the amount of work that's gone in by all departments and cross departments, committees, individuals and groups in this, your NGOs um, that are out there. And as I said, sometimes we come in here and we criticise constantly for probably not doing the right thing, but that's an opinion as well. But to actually sit here or stand here tonight and say, look, we are actually all in this together. And we all know, we've all been touched with some probably personally some others, you're, you're touched one way or another, you know a family or you're directly involved in it or have been directly in, uh, um, inflicted by it. And the one thing I, I always feel about this, and I've always been very passionate about it, is if we can do one thing right, and in 10 years time, when we're, God, if God spares us, and we're walking down, we'll say, and we might meet each other on the street, hopefully, and you'll say, we'll say to each other, do you know what? I'm glad that we stuck together on this. I'm glad that we worked together on this. And I'm glad that we have a system now that works. And I mean, that, I mean, when I say a system that works, we have to be empathetic with the people that are struggling, but we have to be empathetic with the people that will be working on the front line in this. And I think this has to be a massive joined up approach that really, really has to be resourced and supported. And I think, mm -hmm. even speaking on my behalf, but even accepting what Deputy Ward said, this is all in good faith, and you need trust and good faith to have a good working relationship as well. And I'm just hoping that in 12 months' time, that we might, may not be back here discussing this bill, that we might be discussing the overall bill and saying, right, we have X, Y, and Z put in place, we have moved forward, um, we have certain plans in place already. We may need to work together again and hopefully that can be achieved, as I said, because, as I said, we're all in here as legislators, and we need to try and do the right thing. And I, I've been in out here for, what, seven years, and, and I do feel that if we're not going to give the generation now the support that they need, we're not going to have them in the near future. And the way things are going with economies and the way the world economy is going at the moment, these people need help. And I do think, and I'll fi fi uh, finish on this, Chair, the most important thing about the Citizens' Assembly on the drugs as well, we must start to take the criminal aspect out of these people that are using 
alcohol or drugs as their self-medication because they're in a bad place. I do think that the, the justice system has a massive part to play in this as well. But I do, do commend that the two ministers that have the responsibility for your two portfolios are here and take it seriously tonight. And again, I just want to thank Deputy Warden, Deputy Gould and all the speakers here tonight for this. And thanks to the chair for the, the patience on this. And as I said, hopefully it's onwards and upwards on this and we can do the right thing. Got a meal, Back to government for... Um Minister Nocton, five minutes. Thank you for your look. And I, I too would like to thank uh, <clears throat> Deputies Ward and Gould for the opportunity to discuss the important topic of dual diagnosis here this evening. I'd like to highlight progress in relation to dual diagnosis under the National Drug Strategy, which comes under my remit as Minister of State for Public Health, Wellbeing and the National Drug Strategy. The National Drug Strategy, Reducing Harm, Supporting Recovery, represents a whole of government response to the problem of, of drug and alcohol use in Ireland. As Minister with responsibility for the National Drug Strategy, I can assure you that the government is committed to its full implementation. Giving people a say in their own treatment and supporting them to play a role in their own recovery as part of a health-led, person-centred approach is at the heart of the strategy. Improving outcomes for people with co-concurring co-occurring mental illness and substance misuse problems is a key strategic action under the National Drug, St Drug Strategy. In this context, I would like to welcome the work underway in the HSE on dual diagnosis. It's very important that people with a dual diagnosis receive an assessment, an onward referral and timely access to appropriate treatment. People presenting with both addiction and mental health problems are often among the most vulnerable in our society and we need to ensure that the treatment given to these individuals is based on a strong evidence base and drawn from best practice. I'm aware that the recent Health Research Board evidence review on dual diagnosis treatment services demonstrates that there is good evidence that greater integration of mental health and addiction services leads to improved treatment outcomes among this group and this is very welcome. Enhancing access to and delivery of drug and alcohol services in the community was identified as one of the six strategic priorities in the midterm review of the National Drug Strategy, which was completed in 2022. I understand that the Strategic Implementation Group 2, which includes representation from drug and alcohol task forces, HSE, TUSLA and the community and voluntary sector, has identified dual diagnosis as a priority area of focus for enhancing services in community settings. And I look forward to seeing this new initiative implemented and to hearing the progress that will be made. And I'm confident that this initiative will help in improving people's lives and help them on the road to recovery. As mentioned by Minister Butler earlier, this week the government agreed to establish a Citizens' Assembly on drug use. This assembly will look at all aspects of drug use in Ireland today, including what changes might be made at a policy, legislative and operational level to reduce the harmful effects of illicit drug use. The work of the assembly will be very important to ongoing discussions on dual diagnosis, including the bill here before us today. Allowing the work of the assembly to take place will better inform the debate on this bill in 12 months' time. As we all know, mental illness and addiction uh, frequently occur together, but have traditionally been treated separately, often in isolation. But I welcome and I echo the comments of my colleague, Minister Butler, in relation to progress with the HSE's clinical programme for dual diagnosis and welcome the implementation of the HSE's model of care following approval from the College of Psychiatrists. I welcome the progress with the selection of the dual diagnosis sites across the country and the commencement of recruitment of posts for these sites, beginning with CHOs 3, 4 and 9 mentioned by Minister Butler. And I look forward to the further rollout of the model of care across the remaining CHOs. As Minister Butler stated, further resourcing will be needed to continue the rollout of the teams and the model of care, and we will continue to seek any additional funding required in future estimates processes. I'd like to conclude by confirming that we as a government are not opposed to this private member's bill before us this evening. However, the timed amendment will afford the Department of Health the space to progress the matter in, a, in collaboration with deputies to ensure that the challenges faced by those with a dual diagnosis in accessing service appropriate to their needs can be met and can be tackled. I'd like to finish by thanking 
thanking you all for the valuable contributions that you've made here this evening um, and uh, again to thank Deputies Ward and Gould for raising the matter and I look forward to further progress being made on the matter in due course. Minister Proposer Mark Q has uh, 10 minutes. Good morning, uh, um, First, I want to start off by thanking my colleagues here for supporting me in today and other contributions because they're, they're really, really vital. I just want to welcome uh, Minister Norton. This is my first um, engagement with you as the uh, Minister with responsibility for drugs, and I wish you the very best in your new role because it's a really, really important role and it's something that we need to do better as, as, a, as a society. And, and Minister Butler, I want to thank you for being here as well. In fairness to you, through all my time, in three years now at this stage, you've never ducked a debate in here when it comes to this. And this is probably one of the more collegial debates that we're having so far because there's a lot of this being given in good faith and we are willing to work with you in, in constructive opposition, as I said, in the very start. There's just, I want to touch you on a little bit because I, I got a, a parliamentary question during the week and it's in relation to your response on the model of care um, that, that, that you, you mentioned. And the response I got off the HSE, this is only this day last week I got this, um, the draft model of care for dual diagnosis was approved uh, clinically by the HSE Chief Clinical Officer on the 7th of April 2022. Following the same, it was sent to the College of Psychiatrists on the 13th of April 2022 for the approval by the Clinical Advisory Group. It goes on to say, we are waiting for a response from the College of Psychiatrists in this regard. So the College of Psychiatrists, according to the, the PQ that I got, um, has this report the last 10 months and have not responded. There doesn't seem to be a, a, a matter of urgency about this. And Minister, I want to ask, can you make this a priority that the College of Psychiatrists respond and that there are no more delays? Okay, that's the response I only got this day last week. They said that I had, they hadn't responded yet, and it's yeah, 10 months sorry down the line. Okay, yeah. not fine, walk away. If it's good news, you can interrupt me. I have no problem <laughs> with that. And I go on to the CHOs, which you mentioned. So, CHO area 3, which includes Limerick, Clare, North Tipperary, has been identified as the first adult diagnosis team, with many of the team members already recruited, and that's really, really welcome. However, the response I got said there was uh, CHO area 3 recently identified possible issues with, building, with the building site for this team. The HSE were advised in December 2022 that a building inspection by an engineer is planned to take place in possibly January 2023. I'm not sure whether that inspection has taken place yet. We're in, we're in February, um, but it doesn't seem to be, it just seems to be another hold up again. So I'm just asking again if you can find out what's happened with that one. Um, CHO Area 4, which includes the Cork and Kerry teams, has been identified as the second adult dual di diagnosis team site. And since there was no applicant uh, for the consultant post, uh, external agencies through PASS have been involved in trying to recruit a consultant from other countries. I was wondering, has any progress been made on filling this post yet, Minister? But what concerns me of that is the remaining post in CHO Area 4 will be advertised once the consultant has been identified. Now, why is this? Like, why can we not start building wherever multidisciplinary team is needed while this vacuum is there with consultant psychiatrists? There seems to be an issue with, with recruiting consultant psychiatrists in the Kerry region in general at the, at the moment in relation to with the Maskey report and CAMS and wherever, everything else that's going on. So why were still looking, and I know doubt that the HSE are actively looking for a consultant psychiatrist for this post that I'm talking about, why can't we start recruiting the multidisciplinary team? It just, it just makes um, a lot of sense. Um, accommodation for this team has been identified and it's co-located with the Community Alcohol Programme and the HSE Addiction Service, and this will enable better cross-divisional working, and this is welcome, but we need urgency, as I said, in relation to the staff in this facility. CHO Area 9 has been identified as the first adolescent dual diagnosis uh, hope team site, which is really welcome to see that adolescents are being looked at as well, and I, I welcome that. And the team will be advertised so shortly in partnership with the HSE Social Inclusion. And this is positive, and then it's not positive, I'll go to it now, because I mentioned Keltoy already. So following discussions of CHO Area 9, the prim uh, primary care has agreed in principle for Keltoy Centre in St Mary's Hospital in the Phoenix Park is to be used as the HSE National Dual Diagnosis Rehabilitation Centre. Now, Minister Norton, your, your previous uh, 
Minister, in your role, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Fian will stick to the back teeth to me, bring up Keltoy every chance I got with him in relation to this. So I welcome that seems to be progress on this because this site was closed temporarily three years ago uh, for COVID measures and then it, was, uh, uh, then it was stayed closed in relation to the, the emergency we have with international protection applicants and, and the Ukrainian uh, applicants as well. So I welcome that it's, it's almost. It, it's, the facility looks like it's reopening, and this would really make a difference for those with dual diagnosis who would do, detox from whatever, whatever substance they have been addicted to. It's really a vital um, facility for rehabilitation. It's a facility, the reason I talk about it so often, it's a facility that I know very well from my previous role. It's a facility that I would have known would have saved lives. Um, previously, if, if somebody was going into, say, Kundara in Cherry Orchard for a, 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 a detox, coming off whatever street drugs they're on, coming off methadone for a detox, there used to be a door-to-door -door service from Kundara to Keltoy. So what used to happen was they do the detox and then they might wait for five, six weeks in order to go into Keltoy. What happened in that gap in them four to six weeks was some people, after they left, they had the relapse, went back on drugs, they started using drugs, the same level they don't, were using before their detox, and they overdosed, overdosed and sometimes people died. And I knew a lot, an awful lot of people that, I know a lot of people, not an awful lot of people that would have passed away in that. And there was a campaign on the ground from myself and other frontline addiction workers at the time to close that gap. So they had a door-to-door -door service. So you finish your detox, and then you could go straight into Keltoy for rehabilitation, and it was vital. But since Keltoy is closed, that piece is not there anymore and it's a missing piece in the jigsaw so I urge you uh, to everything they have to make sure that that promise is kept that's in it and that, that facility is back opened. Just looking at the in, in the relation to the what I said in the CHO so in some CHO areas we have a staff but we haven't got the buildings and in other CHO areas we have the buildings but we haven't got the staff. Right? Let's do put our heads together and see can we get this working because we have a chance here to, to get this right. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So I, I'm positive today. It's a, a good week this week. I said, I said to you earlier on, Minister, I had a really good engagement with the HSE in relation to CAMS, and I do genuinely believe that things will start moving in a really positive direction then. And then hopefully, with the, all the other um, programme of work in relation to drug diagnosis that's coming down in the next year, that we can see progress in this as well. So I want to thank everybody that took part in the debate, and I thank all the staff for staying back, and the, the, the late shift as well. And hopefully, I'll shut up now so we can all go home. So thanks thank very you, much. Deputy. Thank you. So in the name of the Minister for Health, the question is that the amendment be made. Na chakti atar hev an keshta abridish ta. Na chakti atan agunya abridish neil. Sheila McGuinn and Kesh Richard. Thank you. So is the motion as amended agreed to? Agreed.